for men's health. So we're really excited that um, this combination has been brought together to, 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 to share on those, those various perspectives. So the way that we will begin out is that we have Arlene King, um, and I will actually ask just for a seamless, just an easier scene, is if you can just introduce yourself so that you can give that context uh, for folks as you pass it along. And as you see, we'll walk along the panel, and then at the tail end of that, we will open up the room again to questions um, from the floor. Okay? Perfect. Go for it. Hello. Yeah, my name is Dr. Arlene King, and uh, I was a family physician once upon a time. Uh, I recently came back to BC and have been recently appointed as the Interim Executive Medical Director in Fraser Health within population and public health, and I think I'm quite a bit over my the course of my public health career as well. My most recent appointment was, prior to this, was as Chief Medical Officer of Health for the province of Ontario. Okay. Sorry, Arlene, why don't, we, why don't we just go right into your presentation and then we'll just... Thank you um, very much, uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here, and I think if I leave you with one key message in it, really is a follow-up from Gary's presentation is that family physicians and organized medicine are very important to influencing the creation of healthy public policies to address the determinants of health. So my presentation is going to be threefold. One is providing the public health perspective on the determinants of health. And we're more likely, I think, in public health now to talk about the determinants of health because they cover a whole range of determinants, socioeconomic determinants um, and uh, determinants within the physical environment as well. Uh, the role of public health and the social determinants of health. And finally, I'm going to go right down to the uh, I would call relatively micro level in terms of public health action in influencing the social determinants of health in Fraser Health. So just a quick reminder of what we view as health, and I think public health pretty widely espouses its general view of health, and I just want to just point out that that overall view of health goes back an awfully long way as well. Next slide. So again, uh, in public health, we have a, I would call it a broad environmental or place-based perspective on health. And uh, again, making the following comments, good health starts long before we visit doctors. It starts in our childhood, our homes, our schools, our workplaces, our communities. The factors that influence health life for most part outside of the health sector and then I just wanted to draw attention to a report that I actually wrote in my first year as Chief Medical Officer of Health in Ontario basically stating that public health, small p, small h, is in fact everyone's business. So, duh, what are the determinants of health? Well, they're listed there and I won't spend a lot of time on them. But I just want to make a point, and I will show it graphically, that health status improves at each step up the income and social hierarchy. Uh, because, of course, higher income determines living conditions and the ability to purchase resources. This um, graph comes, I don't have it, uh, a legend there, but I think it was originally put out by the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, but this data have been basically cited in many, many locations and many reports since. And basically the key point here is that 60% of uh, the socioeconomic and physical determinants of health uh, really are uh, attributable to improving and addressing our health. And uh, sadly, uh, in terms of our overall health, only 25% of that is actually contributed by the healthcare system per se. Moving on to this diagram, and I find this really quite helpful. This is a diagram that was first developed by the current director of the Center for Disease Control. It's a five-tier pyramid that really best describes the relative impact of different types of interventions and provides a framework to improve health. At the very bottom of that pyramid, uh, indicating the interventions with the greatest potential 
to impact population health or the efforts to, in fact, address the socioeconomic determinants of health. So income, education, housing as examples. Uh, and in ascending order, so as you move up, are those that change the context to make individual default decisions or individuals' default decisions healthy and clinical interventions which are at the top that are in the domain of the healthcare system per se. So interventions following within the lower part of that pyramid tend to be more effective because they reach broader segments of society and they really require far less individual effort as well. So moving on, so again, this is a, a public health paradigm that I drew to try to, I think, position public health within, I guess, overall social context. And I think we believe that we're quite uniquely positioned to work with both health sector and non-health sector partners because the programs and the issues that we are working on span many sectors beyond the health sector. So we sort of straddle both. So on the right, as a critical component of the health sector, strong alignment and integration between public health and health services are important to advancing health equity and improving individual and population health. However, we recognize that good health comes from a variety of factors and influences that we've talked about already. So on the left side of that Venn diagram, um, just noting that public health works closely with non-health sector partners at provincial and local levels, and that we work to influence, support, and help shape legislation, policies, and programs that affect health and often provide the evidence, as I mentioned, related to health risks and ways to reduce them. So in terms of what the roles are of public health, specifically with respect to the social determinants of health, I think first and foremost it's creating and using data to inform a collective understanding of the determinants of health, to highlight inequities and to frame problems and also to engage in meaningful partnerships to seek policy change and improvements in service delivery. And really through that to achieve collective impact. And in the appendix, I don't know if the presentations are going to get posted, I'm not going to talk about it, but I have a slide in the appendix on the approach to actually achieving collective impact. So how do you do that when you're working with a whole lot of other people that have totally different masters and different mechanisms of accountability. And it really describes the approach that brings together public health and other health, I'm going to call them health creating sectors to address issues using a common agenda, shared measurement, continuous communication, and a very strong commitment to creating impact. Another role, as has already been pointed out by Diana in Ontario, there actually was funding as part of the poverty reduction strategy in Ontario, and I was there to actually support social determinants of health nurses as well. So next slide, I'm going to start talking a little bit about, and I'm going right down to Fraser Health now, is um, creating the whole role with respect to creating and using data. And uh, so this is, um, uh, a survey that was done uh, called My Health, My Community, and I'm not going to get into detail because I don't have time, but it essentially provides data right down to the community level. So if you go to My Health, My, Health, My Community, we're talking about local data, it actually is there for Fraser Health by municipality. And then just a couple of, these are Fraser-wide data, just talking a little bit about correlations between income and various indicators of health, and, uh, and then second slide that actually talks about education as well. And then finally, the issue of income inequity. These are all from my health, my community, income inequity, and chronic diseases. Another piece of work, next slide, uh, is the development of a health equity uh, assessment tool. And uh, this um, has been developed within, within and is being used within Fraser Health. And uh, I'm just going to basically just gloss over some of the work that has been done in this area within Fraser Health. And then next, um, actually we have a housing committee within Fraser Health as well that I just recently started to co-chair along with mental health and addictions to deal with basically frequent emergency department users to try to address some of the housing needs there. And uh, the dark green really talks about the areas of focus at this point in time. It's only been in place since September of 2015. 
Um, these are some maps, again, in the role of public health in terms of data. These are some maps indicating where some of the resources are for high-risk populations. And then, uh, furthermore, uh, in terms of planning around and informing the planning around health services at housing sites, mapping has been done to actually see which health services currently are provided at any local location. And finally, I want to illustrate something that was worked done by um, uh, folks here in Langley, and uh, I think we have both Ellen and Dr. Lee here uh, who have more data on this, but this is an example of public health engaging in meaningful partnerships to promote policy change, and uh, the work was done through the Healthy Community Partnerships Initiatives in Langley. Uh, this work was, I think, called Poverty and Prosperity, and it came out of that work. The Langley Division of Family Practice supported the development of a patient journey map uh, for youth, senior, and a single mother. And the division led a community-wide workshop for reviewing myths and facts, creating a collaborative vision, hosting a gallery walk on the patient and uh, on the patient journey maps, and identifying and prioritizing barriers. Uh, these, in fact, are the gallery walks that was developed and promising practice images that were created. So you can talk to either Ellen, with your arm, or Leo Wong, who is the board chair of the Division of Family Practice, and they have further information on this work. And I just want to close by saying that equality is not always justice, or it is not always equity. Next slide, and final slide. So taking it one step further, it is about policy changes or system level interventions. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. I'm Dean Brown, GP from the North Shore. And I'm here to speak about Health Connection Clinic. And uh, I'm honored to be able to speak to you today. I'm surprised at the turnout. Uh, I also know that obviously so many people in this room know more than I do about the topic. Uh, but uh, if you can do it, that'd be great. Um, so just to give you a bit of an overview of Health Connection, um, it's a um, <coughs> uh, team-based primary care is essentially what it's about uh, for people with complex needs. Um, or vulnerable population, and we see it on the North Shore as a service or a network, not just a clinic or a place. Uh, it's actually a collaboration, and collaboration is one of the themes that really informs, I think, a lot of the work around social determinants, and certainly our work with Health Connection. It's a collaboration between the North Shore Division of Family Practice and the Health Authority, and I know that those kind of relationships have not always been easy to establish in, in, uh, as the division process gets going, but luckily on the North Shore we were able to uh, get underway with that fairly quickly. So the clinic opened in uh, July 2013, so it's up to celebrating its third anniversary shortly. Uh, one of the things I was going to say too is that again about collaboration, I know that many of you in this room, as I say, know more about this than I do, so luckily at the end we're going to have the opportunity, I hope, for me to ask you some questions and, and really introduce that collaborative element into uh, some of what I'm saying. So what we're doing is providing team-based care and really it's about attachment so that everyone tends to think of health connection as being for the unattached, but actually the way we view it is it's really team-based primary care and folks who were unattached or impossible to attach in an average practice become attached to us, to health connection and we really deal with a range of populations and ages. And I can't resist the comment, actually, that people are noticing the problem being fee-for-service, and I'd say, yeah, fee-for-service is an issue, but really, in a way, what the bigger problem is, the lack of a team. It isn't so much about the payment model, that's a big part of it, but really it's the team. When, when we say we don't have time to speak for service, it's actually, we need a team around us. So luckily we've been able to create that at Health Connection. So our team looks like this, the MOA, and you notice I put that first, she's the most important person of all. Social worker, uh, an MRP, which could be a physician or a nurse practitioner, an RN, and a lot of these people, some of these folks we don't have every single day, we just have them certain half days or a day, and a coordinated person, Nicole Latham, who's wonderful and makes everything run. Uh, and, but in addition to that on the team are obviously the client, the patients, and the family and friends. 
And we also use learners mindfully. So we have um, medical students, MP students, family practice residents, and psychiatry residents. And trust me, they are amazing as members of this team, and they love it as well. And a social worker, plus community partners, and similar clinics that we try to take the opportunity to learn from. Um, and some of those community partners that we use, and we try and bring them into the room whenever we can, quite literally. Lookout Shelter, uh, Only Burn Family Services, which provided us a social worker along the way. RCMP, we've been able to make good connections with them. And of course, the Emergency Department, Lionsgate Hospital, and Mental Health Substance Use, um, parts of the North Shore program, and, and more. That's incomplete, actually. Um, and along the way, we've developed something called the AMPS Complexity Tool, which tries to take a look at the uh, bigger picture of attachment, medical, psychiatric, and social determinants, and I've got some examples of it, and it's on the next slide. Um, so that's it there. We try and rank every patient along those lines because we think it's important as physicians, we're pretty good at getting the A and the M right, but the A being attachment, M being medical, P being psychiatric or psychological, and S being social determinants of health, and in there, we rank all of those things, and one of the things we ask them is, how, uh, how easy is it for you to make ends meet at the end of the month? Are you having trouble? So we're trying to bring that uh, poverty tool into our complexity tool and use it with every patient. Um, so we have a developmental evaluation going on uh, the whole time. Developmental meaning that it's integrated with your process and that it started more or less before your uh, activity did. And it shows that we have managed to decrease to an extent ER visits, length of stay, and readmissions while providing primary care. Um, so I, I put down that we've attached 600 patients. I'm not sure if that's really true, but it's, it's some hundreds of patients anyway. <laughs> and so really health connection, seeing it another way, is system change. It's a right implementation of primary care. It's not only something aimed at special populations. It's actually good primary care done in a good way. And in our instance, but I think in all cases, social determinants need to be in scope. Um, next slide. So a few lessons, collaboration works, social determinants need is obviously there even on the wealthy community of the North Shore. And there's a community trying to happen, I think, within our community of high needs folks. It's interesting to see them getting together. Um, next slide. Um, see that these have been some of the challenges. and. I'm sure there's familiar to you space, the collaborative process, I'm interested in that funding. And next slide. Some of the concerns and hesitations we hear are, it's very nice, but this is the Cadillac of healthcare and we can't afford it for everybody. Next slide. But the answer to that is actually you own the Cadillac. It's big, shiny, expensive, it eats a lot of fuel, it's dated, hard to maneuver, costly to maintain and only runs on the main roads. Uh, <laughs> ours is a little more maneuverable than that. So some of our next steps are to think about outreach. We're doing that. Uh, Patient-centered medical home is part of the initiative of our times, obviously. Supporting the client community that's trying to happen. Uh, making maybe a North Shore primary care center that has some of these elements. Linking to uh, like-minded organizations and much more. And last, uh, next slide. Uh, so these are some of the questions I want to leave with you. How do we show the business case for collaborative team care and for social determinants integration into care? And how do we collaborate? And it's not just a kumbaya concept. It's how do we work with each other specifically and get these things done and do them efficiently so that they can be integrated well into practice and we can sell it to the rest of the healthcare system. Thanks very much. We've asked these guys to do a heroic task and try desperately to stay to five minutes so we had a little bit of room for uh, questions. So thank you, Dean. Uh, hi, my name is Vanessa Bersik. Um, as a brief intro, um, the study of validating a poverty screening instrument for primary care was my residency research project. And shortly thereafter, I got hit by a car my bicycle, uh, had many fractures, and, Injuries and was off work for a few years and was so grateful that people like Gary Block and the CMA were able to move forward the equity agenda. Um, while I was at home, um, I kept thinking about this issue, doing a little bit of consulting work from home, and then eventually founding a nonprofit society called Basics for Health Society. Um, what came out of my work 
uh, research-wise was recognizing that physicians simply can't do this work alone, which is something that Dean and others have echoed. And so what we wanted to do was, and you can go to the next slide, what we wanted to do was build capacity and help for uh, clinicians to do this work. Um, so this, uh, we transitioned to a nonprofit society after Impact BC ran a pilot of this work. And um, our mission is on, uh, our vision is on top and our mission is on the bottom. But basically what we're doing, uh, and currently as a nonprofit society, simply because the system does not have a lot of inroads for doing social determinants work, and yet we recognized in the context of the education that's happening around social determinants that we needed to build capacity and support. So uh, we're currently applying for charitable status, although our longer term vision is to be able to offer the expertise uh, in an integrated way within the healthcare system rather than operating from a volunteer-based model. That to say, I do a lot of this work in my spare time and evenings and weekends because I care so deeply about it. Um, so Basics for Health is based on the work of Health Leads USA and what we do is we um, train, and the training is really the heart of what we do, uh, students to act as patient support workers, patient navigators in that type of role which allows clinic social workers or clinic uh, clinical staff to practice at the top of their license. A referral can be done through patients directly or through healthcare providers. There's a program currently operating at Reach Community Health Center, uh, which is sustainable and ongoing. And the next slide, Dan. Um, Connect for Health. So before I go on to talk about this program, um, these two pieces of information are not correct. There was a name change in the program early on because of confusion. Um, the phone numbers are correct, but if you Google Pain BC Connect for Health, um, all the information will come up. Um, but after uh, two months of incorporating the nonprofit society, we were able to get funding through Pain BC to offer social determinant support for patients living with chronic pain in BC. So if any of your patients uh, of whom there are so many living with chronic pain, can access social determinant support by phone and by email through this program. Um, what you see on the left, sorry, go back. What you see on the left is some data from the first year of our program, and I'll only mention two highlights, one of which is that despite this being a service for social determinants, most people are reaching out with health services. People are operating within a biomedical framework and it's tough to shift them towards even identifying what their needs are because they've never been validated in the system before. And on the bottom graph, uh, it's how many uh, files have remained open and how many we're able to close after different numbers of days. And that's one thing that we're learning, that needs are tremendous in this group. Um, and they can't be met in a short period of time, which reinforces the need for team-based and ongoing support. So briefly, I'll talk about a few lessons that I've learned in doing both the research and the work with Basics for Health Society. Uh, I actually thought I had 10 minutes to present, but I'll try to be very brief so I can just cover the, the things. So one that several people have mentioned is gradients. We focus on high users in the healthcare system, and yet social determinants needs fall on a spectrum. The spectrum is shown in the graph on the right, which is Michael Marmot's work out of the UK. But the gradient exists on an individual patient level too. And this was a slide, um, or this is an image, we all have these like, favorite images that we have in the work that we do, and that's one of mine on the top left, which is that the steeper the slope, the more barriers the person has. And so the places for intervention are numerous. They're in that big black ball of health hazard, which represents the biomedical intervention, but the slope of, the, um, of, of that wedge matters even more. But there's one important lesson that's come from uh, the research that I've done, and that is that if you some people who have multiple barriers, if you start adding biomedical problems onto an existing problem list full of socioeconomic needs, you're simply making their problem list longer. And so we have to be very careful about causing harm and perpetuating um, shame and further barriers by making their problems seem bigger. We'll go on to the next slide. This came from subsequent qualitative study that I did following the poverty screening study that I'm currently in the process of submitting for publication. And that, a big theme that came from my work is the shame and power dynamics that are inevitable in this work. And it's probably the thing as clinicians we need to be most attentive to. I'll give you a chance to read these, well, I'll just read them out loud. 
The class then presents me, maybe. Here I am struggling to feed myself, and here's this person who makes $150,000 who's supposed to give me the answer in 15 minutes about a life that she can't understand. The doctor thinks they can read your mind, but unfortunately they cannot. But it is hard trying to admit that, being embarrassed knowing we're a lot lower than everybody else. And on the other side of the equation, a participant who actually felt very well supported by his GP talked about welcoming vibes in his family doctor's office. He felt valued, respected, and liked. And that meets that need of being able to overcome the shame and power dynamics uh, in this work. So uh, David Williams out of Harvard um, is an amazing and inspiring person in my work. And he has studied everyday discrimination. And this is where the poverty work has taken me. This slide gives you a sense of the kinds of questions that are asked in his questionnaire on perceived daily discrimination. But what is important is the next slide, um, which is that the link between perceived discrimination and health outcomes is just as strong as that within poverty and health outcomes. So reinforcing this issue of perhaps decreasing the hierarchy and really focusing on patient-centered um, care. Next slide. Finally, um, I'm becoming a lot more interested in trauma-informed care. And if anyone is working on this subject, please, please come speak to me. Um, because histories of trauma are very much at the heart of two things. One, why people uh, continue to have difficult life experiences, but also uh, difficulties coping and ongoing increased reaction to life chronic stress. And so going even further upstream in poverty, what we're starting to see is that people get stuck in a cycle of marginalization. And essentially, they're stuck in fight or flight mode. And when you're in fight or flight mode, you're fighting for survival. And you are not in a position to be able to connect to people, either in a care environment or socially, in terms of social support. And you can't do long-term planning. That's simply not how the brain works. So we have to remember when we're working with these people that when they're in the situation of high stress, that they're actually in a very difficult place in terms of being able to plan for better health outcomes. And that the treatment for this is in what the literature is calling disconfirming experiences. Because the story of long-term marginalization and stress is deeply embedded not only in your cortex, but in the deeper centers of your brain. And those patterns of marginalization uh, become our implicit truth. And people recreate those experiences in their dynamics with healthcare providers and in, and in perhaps maintaining that hierarchical and power dynamic difference. So what we need to do as practitioners is disconfirm that experience and create an environment of permission and safety for patients. Finally, I need to say a little about system level advocacy, which is critical. Let me just say that uh, the conversation that I had with Arlene um, earlier this morning was largely about partnership between public health and clinical practice. And I think where the big biggest bang for our buck that Gary spoke to as well is in accountability for practice populations. Because that's what allows us to see needs uh, on a practice level, deliver services for those in greatest need. What actually allows us to look beyond individual patient care to those who are um, perhaps not coming knocking on our door. We have, a, when, there's a, when there's a greater uh, demand for doctors and health services and there is supply of them, we are in danger of perpetuating an inherently discriminatory practice where we serve people who can access the system the most easily. What we need to do is go looking after those with greatest need. Um, last slide, and uh, Trish Garner, sitting at the table with the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition, will attest to this. BC is the one province without a poverty reduction strategy. And as clinicians and people in healthcare, we have a very powerful voice and we should use it. That's all I have to say. Facilitator fail. Uh, you have 10 minutes. Questions are held to the afternoon. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Val Trabillis, and I have the honor of leading the Child and Youth Mental Health and Substance Use Collaborative in the province of BC. And I have a couple of things that I'd like to talk to you about today. I'm no expert, luckily all of you are, and these esteemed colleagues up here. Um, but I just wanted to talk to you about some of the things I've experienced and see in the work that I've done over the past uh, 20 years in BC. Just wanted to start with a reminder of health and doctor leadership. 
Some years ago, doctors voted to take a percentage of fee increases and align it to high priority populations. This is a really big deal. It's a first in Canada, and I think it's really spawned a great deal of innovation in this province. And we sometimes take that for granted now. I never forget it because I live and breathe the results in community because of that decision. So I want you to think about things that have occurred that give us hope and that it's not a massive thing that we're starting at the bottom. We've already made some strides here. Because of um, divisions of family practice, GPs in the interior identified the horrendous status of child and youth mental health in this province. There's power, there's leadership. Then there was joint clinical committees, primarily um, uh, 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 shared care, but uh, then GPSC and special services, decided to fund the Child and Youth Mental Health Collaborative. And then further agreed to take a risk of providing values-based funding rather than population-based funding. Huge shift. When I googled values-based funding, I found lovely examples around using and thinking about the social and economic determinants of health. And then it, you follow the algorithm down, and then it became population-based at the end. So you lost the power of the social and economic determinants of health. In our model in, in BC for the collaborative, it's values-based. It's based on geography, on the social and economic determinants of health, and it's also based on intergenerational trauma. And when you look at that, that's why um, Haida Gwaii local action teams get the same as Abbotsford and Mission. It's only fair that, but it was a brave, brave step for um, those committees. Doctors and members of the health authorities sit with community members on these local, 64 local action teams, 2,000 people involved across the province, sit, I think, and sometimes quite vulnerably, with community uh, partners, with youth, with parents, and, and improve um, mental health and substance use services, and also um, building capacity in schools, which I think uh, in communities and schools, that's where the work is, has to happen, and I think that's where primary health care will have a bigger role in the future. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about, because we have a timekeeper here, so I've got rid of a whole page of notes. Um, I wanted to talk about um, physicians as healers, because I think that's another leap that's occurring in our province. And it's and I when I say doctors, I mean doctors, but I also think about um, clinicians and so on. Um, a few years ago, an organization called FORCE in BC uh, did a survey with many thousands of families. And they expected the results would be around mental health. And what they expected to see would be weightless would be number one. And interesting, it wasn't weightless. It was the quality of the encounter once they got through the door to see the physician. It made the difference between the, with, the, with the health outcome, with their experience of care. So um, recently, I don't know if you remember it, uh, there's a young man who was on the front page of the Vancouver Sun. His name is Corey, and he's given me permission to talk about him today. <coughs> Corey uh, was raised in poverty. Uh, he uh, was raised with a um, great deal of dysfunction and was um, addicted to, to drugs uh, from about the age of 10 went and experienced probably every service we could offer. And um, he said 
During those years, he's in his early 20s now, and he's a leader in the collaborative. He's a leader in one of the local action teams. And he said that, that experience in the last three years has trumped a lot of things that happened in the previous uh, 10 years. The, t the things that he said saved his life had to do with the attributes of the clinicians and physicians. There were two that he believed saved his life. And I'm going to read his, his um, uh, see if I can look at my glasses. The first thing was the amount of respect. He does not look like most people in this room. And so when he walks through a door, whether it's an ER or a physician's office, there's a little bit of, I'm a bit nervous of this person. But it was the respect, the instant respect that he felt and the honoring of him by those, that, that clinician and that physician that had such a pr profound effect on him. He talked about the term attachment and I was thinking about GP for me. And he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about the clinician and the physician showing him their humanity. Reaching out to him, human to human. I also um, have suffered and I also understand. And I, I tell, will tell you a little bit. I'm a father, I'm a mother, I'm a neighbor. Um, I'm a son, I'm a daughter. That kind of thing coming from the, the clinician and the physician, pulling back the professional skin to show the human underneath made a huge, huge difference to him. And he felt when he walked away, he did not feel alone. And the last thing was talking about hope. He said, that not once did those two providers tell him to give up hope. One of them said when he had relapsed for the sixth time, he said, great progress. You're on this journey, you're getting there, and you've taken one more step. <laughs> and he said that was amazing because all around him, in the eyes of people he was seeing, including his family, was failure, no hope, failure, no hope. And so I think my message with that story of Corey is you have the physicians and clinicians in the room and the health leaders in the room. You have an amazing opportunity to change thousands and thousands of lives. And I'll leave it there. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Janet Austin, and I'm the CEO of the YWCA Metro Vancouver, and I really appreciate the opportunity to join you today. I'm also active as a community volunteer um, with a variety of organizations, so two I will name. One is I'm the public member on the board of the Canadian Pediatric Society, and um, I'm also just concluding my time as uh, chair of the Vancouver Board of Trade. So, so really trying to bridge, uh, you know, bridge the different understandings in different sectors of society and the economy. Which, which, which? Okay, you never know with these things, right? All right. So, just briefly, the YWCA Metro Vancouver is one of the largest and most diversified nonprofits in Metro Vancouver, if not the country. We've been around for almost 120 years, and on an annual basis, we receive visits from about 53,000 people, and we operate in 40 locations throughout Metro Vancouver. So, you can see the size of our operating budget. It's probably small compared with uh, some the, what you, you guys are dealing with in the public health sector, but for a nonprofit, it's pretty significant. Um, we use a, a business model, a social enterprise model, in that we operate a number of very successful um, related businesses which uh, contribute, um, uh, generate significant net revenue, which enables us to fund some of the activities, uh, community service work that's difficult to raise money for. So our hotel gross operating um, revenues are about four million and our net revenue at that one facility is about a million on an annual basis. 
We also use a balanced scorecard um, to try to measure our outcomes, and we have a very particular focus on measuring the success um, at an individual level of our, our clients, our various clients. So our primary client, we serve everyone, but our primary client is a single mother and her children, and we attempt to support her by surrounding her with an array of holistic services, and our goal is to support her to achieve personal and economic independence. So you can see that whole range of frontline services that we offer, all of which are very much uh, consistent with what we've been hearing about this morning. And I'll just draw attention to the lower photograph. That's our legal educator, Andrea Vollins. She came to us as a teen mother, uh, with two twins, I think at the age of 16 or 17, needed support graduating high school. And she is now, she, um, child care, housing, educational support, and she is now in charge of all of our legal education programs, so great success there. We also do advocacy. I think we've had 40 years of, of rhetoric, really, anti-tax rhetoric, that has caused all of us to think of ourselves as taxpayers as opposed to citizens. And so I think we need to change that. I feel that in our country we are seeing that change. I think it's a very positive thing. You see it in the outpouring of support for the Syrian refugees. And I certainly see it in the many young people who come to my office on a regular basis wanting to use their knowledge and skills in service of, uh, of in some social benefit. So to me that's very heartening. Um, so advocacy, again, connected to our frontline service, always, always evidence-based. We try to be collaborative, look for the win-win. Um, two examples, uh, I have the privilege of meeting with Justin Trudeau tomorrow. He wants the advice on uh, affordable housing, so wish me luck. Um, and the other thing I'm doing this evening is we're hosting a public dialogue on the Gian Gomeshi verdict. And the idea there is to look at what needs to change in the justice system to provide better, better supports to the, um, the survivors of sexualized violence. All right, uh, just an example. Um, this is Ali. Um, I think, uh, Chris Locke, where are you? Chris Locke, I'm sure you probably know Ali. Uh, Ali is a, a young woman who uh, came to us through our work in the downtown east side. Um, she had uh, has uh, FASD. Her parents were told that she would never read or write. Um, experienced abuse, drug and alcohol addiction, homeless. Pregnant at, at 26, uh, children apprehended. Um, she's connected with our services and I think had, had special service from Chris. Uh, and she's an outstanding success. Um, she uh, initially was hired by us uh, to do some work as an FASD facilitator. Um, she got some education bursaries from the YWCA. She's, uh, I think, just completed her, her uh, counseling diploma from the Native Education College and she was a class valedictorian and she's looking forward to working in the community. So great story. And this is Jarmaine, um, similar situation, a teen mother. We operate a childcare for teen moms, which is a collaborative partnership with Tupper High School, support for those children and, um, and parenting support, and it allows these young women to complete their education. And her goal, she's done remarkably well, her goal is a career in healthcare. Maybe people can help. Um, so I was asked to talk briefly about the relationship between health and the YWCA. So I've given you a list of some of the different ways that we connect with different aspects of the health system. Um, as you can see, there's a fair bit, but I think that there's potential to do an awful lot more. And uh, I want to just take a moment to really acknowledge Dr. Chris Locke, because if you people don't know, you should. The leadership, Chris, that you have provided has been outstanding sustained over many, many years and has added such incredible value to the services that we provide. And I want everyone to give her a round of applause. <laughs> because she did it. Honestly, I can't tell you how much I would love to have quite a few more of you hanging around the Y. So maybe you'll inspire some of your colleagues here to make that connection. So I won't go into detail here because time is short, but, um, but these are just some examples of what we're, what we're doing. Uh, I want to pay, pay a bit of attention to affordable housing because this is a huge issue, certainly in, in, in Metro Vancouver and really across the country. The cost of housing is, is exorbitant and there's really a lack of family housing and particularly for people who are um, living in poverty. And of course, single mothers and their children are the poorest of all family types and they have the greatest difficulty accessing housing because most most rental housing is bachelor and one bedroom. There's a dearth of, of uh, housing stock that's suitable for families. 
So we've had a long time interest in, in building housing. We operate a number of housing communities um, throughout Metro Vancouver and we're focused on building more. So we currently have four housing projects under construction um, and I'll, I'll highlight, I think probably just one of them, and this is a marvelous project with the Vancouver Public Library. Um, now a few years ago, the city manager at the time, Penny Mallum, called me to say um, that uh, they needed to build a library in the downtown east side, um, and, uh, but they, um, they wanted not to underutilize the site. Um, but they didn't have, weren't able to fund it, and so they asked if we could come to the table. We have done that. We've raised $10 million to cover our costs. We have to cover our capital cost up front so that we can actually afford to operate it on, on rent revenue. And uh, it will have a space, actually, for Chris's excellent work there. So again, that, that broad range of service. Um, and there's a picture of it. And we have three others under construction, and I'm actually trying to get three more going. So that, a little bit of an example. We also do policy entrepreneurship, so we work with youth and care. Um, we had a change to the income assistance regulation made, which enables uh, women who have precarious residency status to actually access income assistance. Um, and then we worked with the province to implement the Single Parents Employment Initiative, which realizes the barriers to employment if you lack childcare, transportation, and education coverage. So, just a few final comments, really. I want to talk about the, what, what we see happening, really, at the federal level, and I have to say I'm quite hopeful. These are some of the promises and some of the actual actions that have, have taken place that will have a significant effect on lifting people out of poverty. And the child, Canada Child Benefit is actually a monumental policy shift. It will lift 300,000 children out of poverty. It will provide um, uh, single parents or parents with uh, 6,400 dollars a year for each child under, under six, 5,400 for each child between six and 17. Um, and um, it's actually shifted the calculation of the living wage uh, positively. Uh, early learning and care, I think this is probably the most thing, the most important thing that we could do in terms of public investment. Um, the, the federal government has indicated an interest in moving in this direction. It's a, it's a ways off, um, but it's something that definitely needs to be supported. And there's very good evidence of the cost benefit of this. So we know that um, in looking at the Quebec um, child care program, increased GDP by 1.7%, which is $5 billion annually. It more than pays for itself. Um, and it lifts an enormous number of people out of poverty. So you can see the results there. These are some of the issues I think that we need to work on together going forward. Um, and I will draw attention just to the third industrial revolution. And I think the potential for real economic and, and uh, political instability flowing from the shifts in technology, which tend to concentrate wealth in the hands of, uh, more wealth in the hands of, um, of um, higher income people already. So what can physicians do? Here you go. Build relationships with organizations like ours. Take a page out of the book of Chris. Um, and then really, I think, you know, the capacity of the philanthropic and the charitable sector and the capacity of the front line, which is you, to deal with these challenges um, is not up to the, you know, the extent of the challenge. We really need systemic change and we really need to advocate as individuals and through our organizations for the kinds of shifts that I'm laying out here. Um, and I encourage you all to do that. Thank you very much and I'm sure I'm past my 10 minutes. <laughs>
And there was one really impactful moment with one of the patients there who had cryptococcal meningitis, unfortunately, because of, of, of HIV. And, and we spent, I think, tens of thousands of dollars um, uh, trying to, to, to provide medical care for this patient. And unfortunately, as we got him better, um, we were looking at discharge. And the best we could come up with was a single night in the shelter. And we had just spent, yeah, I, I can't estimate it entirely, but tens of thousands of dollars on this person, and yet I knew what was impacting their health more than anything was their living environment, the best that I, that I could offer them when I had to go and tell them what our discharge plan was a single line to shelter. And so I really realized that we needed to flip what we were doing uh, on its head and start uh, in a publicly funded medical system, really looking upstream and starting to deal with some of these things. Um, so during uh, medical school, I went to Saskatchewan and I looked at some of their um, health systems there in terms of their cooperative health clinics and, and some of the fantastic work that they've done uh, within that model in del delivering really good primary care up front and dealing with some of their marginalized West Side population. And I got some great experiences there. As people already talked about, you need to see that as a, as a trainee to really be impacted by it. And uh, there's a bunch of stories that I can tell, but I'll, for the interest of time, uh, skip that. And then during residency, I, uh, you know, as Vanessa talks about what she do with her residency project, we actually got to meet at the Family Medicine Forum there because I was doing a workshop on addressing social determinants of health in clinical practice as primary care providers and, and did some work on that. And uh, it was actually, the name of my talk was, but doctor, I can't buy uh, fruits and vegetables at the dollar store. Um, it was me it was rather than Ryan. Though I had the love of meeting Ryan in those early days in Saskatchewan during his switch work, uh, which I got to volunteer and do some work with while I was there, as well as their bus pass and shift, because they just axed the bus pass for their um, people on welfare and disability, similar to what's going on in BC right now. Uh, and then when I came back home to set up shop um, in uh, the family practice, I got some of Anna Reed's patients, I believe, because uh, uh, the doc I took over for and Anna had worked together. Um, and I was just on the street speaking with one of the other docs where some of those photos of the Nelsonites that were that Diana had were taken. Um, and the, the doc had said, well, hey, there's this division thing happening. You know, I think that would be something that um, your passion for social determinants of health would be really impactful for. And so um, slowly did some training that and got on the board and immediately got made the vice chair. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it was actually as I was chair, uh, our executive director and I at one point just said, hey, we, we both looked at some of the work that Gary had done with the Poverty Intervention Tool and said, well, hey, well, can we try to do something local with that? And so dedicated about 4,000 of our budget initially to the Nelson Care Society to modify that tool from Ontario to the community boundary context and just said, we're going to do it there. Let's do it for all of BC. So we built a BC tool, which is available on our website and on your tables. Um, and so immediately started to, to use that and, uh, and take it up with um, my patients. But I have a pretty usual family practice, and uh, I, you know, I'd say that's one of the things that I'm the most passionate about, is not just providing this kind of care for our marginalized populations. These people need this help in every single family practice in the province. It's 10% of every family practice is dealing, uh, the patients are dealing with issues because of the social determinants of health and low SES, and we need to deal with it across the board uniformly. And so, um, you know, I did local CME in my community um, about the poverty tool and about this. I've done a few different sessions locally on this, uh, doing both my residency pro program and then a more recent one. Um, and we brought in some of the nonprofits from the community who gave a, a talk after mine. And I was so honored to get asked by one of them to write a bit of a, a clip um, on the impact of food insecurity and uh, on, on my patient's health. And it was lovely to see in my local uh, paper uh, about three months after that that they had just been given a grant to $50,000 to work on the, um, uh, unfortunately, it's a food kitchen and, um, and uh, uh, food program. But it was so fantastic to see that a little, maybe a little help from me had managed to, to make a bit of a difference. And then I have done some CME work through UBC. I did their broad um, educational session that got broadcast throughout the province. Some of you might have attended that, which was really passionate. And that has led us somewhat to today's um, partnership with Pacific Blue Cross and the Provincial Division's office, office to deliver this, uh, this session, which has been so wonderful um, to do that. But the other thing I have really focused on myself is, is in the educational work that I've done. So both of my medical students, um, speaking with them about social determinants of health, exposing them, yes, to patients and to the poverty intervention tool and community 
resources that are available to them. And I'm actually a core preceptor for our own residency program in Kootenai Boundary, which has just started a little while ago. And I've been working with my resident. We just did her practice improvement project for her first year on trying to embed more universal screening for social determinants of health. Um, and so we did that initially with uh, my complete physicals, we do that as a screening thing, just as a piece of that to embed that. And we recognize that wasn't hitting all the people that it needed to hit. And so we really tried to transform it to whenever we finish an intervention with a patient, if there is physiotherapy or a prescription or anything that comes out of that saying, are finances an impact for you being able to access that care? And if they screen yes, then actually asking the more well-established uh, screening tool, do you have a difficulty making ends meet at the end of the month? And it's been fantastic to see my resident take that up and be really passionate about it and, and really to see that make um, a great established uh, niche within my practice of, of really identifying these. Though, you know, in my community, I see them in grocery stores, I see them on the street. I, I do have a fairly good sense of their lived experience. I walk it every day so I don't have to do a tour of my community because I've done it since I was born. Um, <laughs> And then the most recent thing that we've done through the division as well was, uh, and through GP for Me funding, was um, to embed a social worker within our practice. We actually looked at a tapering subsidy from our division um, to hire a social worker and then try to see if it was sustainable within fee for service, which unfortunately I could have predicted it probably wasn't. We got close. We varied between 60 to 90 percent of her um, salary has been paid through fee for service uh, billings from the doctors in our clinic. But I took the other eight doctors in my clinic grudgingly, um, the board meeting when they approved that we would actually take on this uh, year-long um, subsidy from the division and hire this person. They said, well, Lee, we get you're really passionate for it, so we don't think we're going to lose money as a clinic, so we'll do it because we, we know that you're passionate about it. And now I am not the champion for it. The docs in my clinic say, this was a direct quote, a gift from God. <laughs> The most challenging patients with mental health, um, substance issues, and really impacted by poverty, they say they come in less, in less extremis because of the work that Carly, our social worker, has done. And it was fantastic. I had to be part of hiring her, and she went to the same summer camp as Gary Block, so she knew him quite well. Um, it seems to be a bit of a kaputz out in Ontario. Just um, and, uh, you know, she's actually off on maturity leave right now, and that funding has come up, but the docs have said, hey, we're willing to even look at taking a hit financially every year to continue to provide this service to our patients and to continue to have the benefit of having somebody that is doing disability paperwork for us and really knows that the docs say, we were trained for this. Let us do the medicine and let somebody else that's really skilled do it. But otherwise, we end up doing it if there's nobody there. Um, so that's been a really huge piece. And one of the, the other special moments for me personally in this journey was Bill Clifford, when is, most of you would have heard some of the work that the, the North has been doing in integrating the primary care home. Um, and, uh, and he came up to me really excited at one point. He said, Lee, Lee, we've embedded in the funding model for a complexity rating, your poverty intervention screen one, and actually it's Vanessa's, it's not mine, but um, you know, most of this work, as I have shamelessly stolen from Vanessa and Gary, is standing on the backs of uh, giants and really um, working to collectively to make an impact. But part of that complexity rating is that question, it's embedded in the MOAS EMR now, and you get 1.25 um, increased complexity funding uh, for your patients if they screen positive. Um, for um, being below the low income cutoff line because of that. And so to see that actually embedded, to see that that might mean that we're actually able to hire the Fort St. John or other places that will take this up, social workers because of recognizing that funding in there has been um, really, really impactful. So the last thing I wanted to close with is just uh, maybe a, and seed a little bit of the afternoon discussions are certainly, you know, my barriers are a lot of the interventions as I've done the poverty intervention tool, my working poor, they don't really get much help from that because they are not, they're not at that level that a lot of our, our services provide them in. So I think we need to continue to look at our working poor and how we can support them. And I think we really do need to look at really systemic change about some of the fundamental things like affordable housing. So it's so great that Janet speaks to that a little bit and hopefully she makes a huge impact with Justin tomorrow. Um, you know, there are some major barriers that I think even if we embed social determinant of health lens and focus in the work that we do, um, we, we, we have a lot of work to undo the systemic multi-generational trauma that is affecting the impact 
um, and all of these things for our patients. So I really hope that maybe, as you saw that journey that um, Gary showed with the evolution of the work that they've done, that this is a culmination for me of the evolution um, from individually embedding into practice and using the poverty tool to hopefully make a systemic collective impact. And I really look forward to what we'll do in the afternoon uh, and hopefully addressing some of those things and coming up with some great ideas together about what we can do. Thanks so much. So we have five minutes left, and because I stole five minutes from Dean, he had um, um, it's, uh, just dropped into his comments uh, in his presentation that he really wanted to ask you a question. So I'm going to give uh, this to an opportunity for him to ask into the audience uh, a question that he has of you, and then we will end. <laughs> Great, thanks, Sue. Um, yeah, and I didn't realize that uh, that I was restricted to five minutes. I thought ten minutes had gone by because I'm easily, happily um, able to talk for that long, uh, given the opportunity, and have to be reined in sometimes. So it was no surprise at all. Um, so the questions I wanted to pose to the group for consideration, and I don't expect we'll have an answer before lunch, um, were actually twofold. The first one is how do we show the business case for both collaborative team-based care and for social determinants of health integration? And I use the business case word with a little bit of a cringe, but I know that that is really what has to be done in order to demonstrate to the funders who are doing things with the right mindset, really. They're, they're trying to spend public money in the right way and the best way to get the best results. They need to show, be shown and know that these things work. And I'm convinced they work because I, I've done enough kind of collaborative work along the way with, with colleagues from many professions. Uh, to think that that method is efficient, but how do we show the business case for both collaborative team care and for social determinants integration? And the second question is related to that, and it's how do we collaborate? Like if there's a business case and a right case and an efficiency around these things and we get the work done, how, how does that actually look on the ground? Because that's what we're working with in Health Connection, is, is those kind of questions. So I, I throw those out to you. I know this is a knowledgeable group. Thanks. Right, out to the 56th view. Perfect. Want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm John Hamilton. Uh, I work uh, with the GPSC and with Fraser Health and other GP. I was I was listening to your question. I was thinking, how do we show the wellness case? And I think that the wellness, as was shared. Uh, with many people uh, today in the, in the panel, wellness does improve when we address these issues. And when we're looking at you know, big system change, we have to think really very, you know, in, a, in a large way about the entire context of the individual. In terms of the business case question, I actually think that we're, we are, in many respects, already very significantly resourced, but we don't have our relationships in place in the team-based care piece. We do have social workers working very hard in teams of people, but they're, they're, they're autonomous from the uh, primary care world. And as when we can build the relationships that are immediate and where we share mutual accountability for our patients, because I'm a physician, I think of patients, but when we share that mutual accountability for our patients and our clients, I think that that will compel us to do these things in a, in a way that moves towards the model that you've actually been uh, doing in North Shore, and that I think that uh, we and his team are doing in the Goonies. One more perception. I think from our practice and research, uh, one of the most important things is our willingness to share status and power. And that means working with the community. We don't need to duplicate what's in the community. We need to work differently. We don't all need to bring the same thing to the buffet. So that when we look at uh, um, empowerment, uh, the wife does this very well, um, and look at the strengths of the community, not just the deficits. The business case can be built on that it's actually, that we're actually, you know, that we're actually saving money. We're using our resources better and more effectively. And I, I think that this is an example of, of working across areas, but also we need to think about working interprofessionally 
and, and the social work example is excellent. The work on the North Shore, I'm thrilled I'm from the North Shore, so congratulations, Dean. Uh, we need to share more of what's working and share our recipes with each other. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, yes. Okay, one minute. You, you go first and then I'll go. Oh, sure. Um, just in response to, to measurement, um, so two things. One is that there's a common thread that's happening across the country, but that's not well supported and could use coordination, is the complexity measurement. So Dean's Clinic has the AMPS tool. Um, Gary Block presented on their uh, tablet use in the waiting room. And Ryan Mallon in Saskatchewan is doing very similar work. And we have, we applied actually for CIHR funding last year to try to compare uh, and test some of these complexity measurement tools. And we got turned down and two of the reviewers said uh, it's an invasion of patients' privacy. They're coming in for biomedical of reasons not for social determinants. And that was the reason that our proposal got rejected. That was the primary reason. So. Um, that stigma against doing this work is, still exists, and there's no reason why we need to keep reinventing the wheel of complexity measurement. And let me just uh, transition that into something that I've spoken to uh, a couple people in this room about, which is um, we're moving towards patient-centered medical homes, and we're moving towards more uh, quality improvement, um, accountability for outcomes attached to funding, um, and for uh, responsibility for practice population. And that, it seems that, you know, physicians get really anxious about quality improvement and seeing who of their patient population has fallen through the cracks. And yet, if you're measuring complexity appropriately, you're identifying where the greatest needs are. And that's how a lot of the high-performing primary care models globally work, including Group Health Cooperative, where they identify where the gaps are, and then they support physicians to better meet the needs of the highest-needs patients, which is often why you have poor outcomes in the first place. So, it might be a way to transform the conversation around quality improvement and uh, accountability for outcomes to actually embed an appropriate complexity measure that can figure out why certain patients are falling through the cracks. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, you know, there's no question that there needs to be more cost-benefit work done and that that would be helpful. But I think we could make much better use of some work that has already been done. So I would draw attention to the work of the Human Early Learning Partnership at UBC under the outstanding leadership of Dr. Clyde Hertzman. So I think many of you are familiar with his work with the EDI, the fact that we have, I think it's now up to about 33% child vulner vulnerability rate in BC. The biological rate at which you would expect child to be vulnerable at five is 10 or 15 percent. And so they did some very interesting cost-benefit work a few years ago that demonstrates that we're actually foregoing 400 billion um, in uh, GDP growth over the next 60 years. So um, you know that, that would be the net present value. So that's actually 10 times the provincial debt. So this work is actually really valuable, but I think it hasn't got enough exposure, and it hasn't got enough general exposure. The big challenge, I think, is helping, um, is helping our political leaders to understand that not all of this benefit is long-term, 20 years in the future. There's a fair bit of it that's short and medium term, and that's the kind of information that I think will help, help to shift their um, understanding and their ability to make some shorter-term decisions. And with that, we will close because we are at lunch. Just before folks move, though, uh, I just want to acknowledge that so many of you are in this room. Um, a, a great number of you have joined us, probably because of the quality of uh, the, the people that would be on the panel and what they would bring to the discussion from here forward. So um, thank you for all coming in to be part of this. Uh, we will be in deep discussion in the afternoon. Uh, folks are coming and going, although there's a number of you who are staying over the course of the day. I have, I'm just putting sheets of paper into the middle of the table. If you could at some point just write your name down, just so that we know who chose to be part of this conversation, that would be really helpful for us. Um, and with that, we will be meeting back here at 1.15 uh, to begin the afternoon session. Thanks very much.